this movie I would say there is a close relationship between both the sisters in the movie cast, Jack Angel, alien guard Erica Beck, Myrtle's friend Bob Bergen, male officer Steve Bloom, hammerhead guard Zoe Caldwell, Grant Councilwoman Tia Carrere, Nani Pelka and Eva Chase, Lilo Pelka and Jennifer Darling, female officer Susan Hackarty, rescue lady Amy Hill, Mrs. Hayes Ago Atop Gosawa, truck driver Jason Scott Lee, David Caldna Kevin McDonald, Plickly Mickey McGowan, Computer Voice Conwin Mook, Hula Teacher, Moses Pooloki, Mary Linda Phillips, Coffee Shop Owner Vin Rames, Code Red Bubbles Kevin Michael Richardson, Captain Canada Deborah Rogers, First Officer Omni Chris Sanders, Stitch David Ogden Styers, Jumba, Recently Deceased and Sorely Missed, Rip Mate, Doug Stone, Anson Gitko Miranda Page Walls, Myrtle Edmonds and various additional voices, as usual sources of inspiration, original idea by Chris Sanders release dates, June 16, 2002 in USA, premiere. June 2, 2002 in USA, general release, runtime, minus 85 minutes directors, Dean Blue and Chris Sanchez composers, Alan Silvestri Worldwide Gross, $273 million accolades, minus 10 wins and 27 nominations, including an Oscar nomination 2002 in History Mount Night Iregango erupts in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, displacing an estimated 400,000 people and killing about 147 the Sierra Leone Civil War is brought to an end with a Commonwealth victory and Fortunately, Ivory Coast enters its first civil war following the mutiny led by General Robert Goode. The death of Jonas Savimbi also brings the Angolan civil war to a close. Queen Elizabeth II of the UK celebrates her golden jubilee shortly afterwards. Her mother passes away, aged 101, and is buried in Westminster Abbey. South African Mark Shuttleworth becomes the first African space tourist. East Timor, or Timor Leste, regains independence from Indonesia. The Ugantu train collision occurs in Tanzania, killing 281 people in one of Africa's worst raids. Disasters The Rome Statute enters into force, bringing the International Criminal Court into effect. The African Union replaces the organization of African Unity members of terrorist organization Muslimia detonate a series of bombs at nightclubs in Bali, killing over 200 people in the worst terror stabbed in Indonesia's history. Several armed Chechens seize the Dubov Cathedral in Moscow for three days. The militants are eventually gassed, but this results in the deaths of well over a hundred civilians as well the people of Gibraltar reject joined British-Spanish sovereignty in a referendum, remaining solely under British Dominion U.S. President George W. Bush creates the Department of Homeland Security in response to 9-11, the largest governmental reorganization since the creation of the Department of Defense in 1947 Births of Davis Cleveland, Prince Felix of Denmark, Gavin Matarazzo, Levi Miller, Matty Ziegler and Jacob Sartorius Well, it's good to be back. It's been a pretty hectic time around here lately. First I got snowed in at my grandma's down in London thanks to the beast from the east. Then when I got home I had to replace my aging computer because it wouldn't stop crashing. So, for my first review, written on this new PC, and with a new version of Word to Boot, hence the slide change in formatting, I'm taking a look at Disney's first film of 2002, The Charming Scary Fire on Lilo and Stitch. In the late 90s, as the Disney Studios' high-profile releases were beginning to struggle at the box office, CEO Michael Eisner decided that the time was ripe for a return to a simpler format from yesteryear, with a smaller budget and less costly special effects. Animator Chris Sanders was called upon to pitch an idea for such a project. As it happened, Sanders had been sitting on a story for many years which he felt might be just the thing. Back in 1985, he'd created a strange little creature in a doodle which he named Stitch, with a loose idea in mind about an ugly duckling type of story set somewhere in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. In late 1997, with the help of Thomas Schumacher, Sanders revived the idea and began to develop it, soon to be joined by co-director Dean Deplu. Early concept of Stitch Roy Disney was hesitant about the project at first, but he warmed up to it after seeing some of the beautiful Hawaiian concept art produced by the filmmakers. In May of 1999, the team took a research trip to the islands themselves, where they drew a lot of inspiration from the people and places they saw. Lilo's hometown in particular was based on several real locations in Kauai like Hanapepi and Hanalit. Lilo and Stitch was the second film after Mulan to be produced at the Orlando studio, made with a smaller, more intimate team, on a tighter budget than the Renaissance features added. Its production was reminiscent of Dumbo 60 years earlier, even returning to the delicate watercolor backgrounds of the time instead of the increasingly digitized look of the newer films. In a time of experimentation and uncertainty for Disney, Lilo and Stitch was a relatively safe bet. If it failed, at least it wouldn't have cost the studios much money as some of their earlier productions. However, they needn't have worried, the film became one of the studio's biggest hits of the decade and the last critical success until The Princess and the Frog, 2009. 
While it was hugely popular in its day, it seems to have been forgotten somewhat by the new generation of Disney fans, so if you haven't seen it yet then I hope I can convince you to give it a watch. It's a great example of the potential beauty of simplicity in filmmaking. Characters and vocal performance is Lilo Holdings Grandpa Lilo's friends need to be punished. The film is led by six-year-old Lilo Pelke, the young Hawaiian girl being raised by her older sister in the wake of their parents' deaths. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Lilo is one of the best child characters Disney have ever created, worlds away from the ciphers we've seen in previous films. She's rich and dynamic, with a realistically complex personality filled with quirks that make more sense as we learn more about her. At the start of the film, she has no single goal driving her onwards. She's simply trying to move on from the tragedy that has robbed her family, using a series of coping mechanisms. For example, one of her first scenes has her trying to explain to her Hula teacher why she needs to feed Pudge, a local fish, a sandwich every Thursday. According to Lilo, Pudge controls the weather. Although this might seem odd at first, we later learn that her parents were killed in a car crash during a rainstorm, making her dedication to Pudge feel much sadder in hindsight. It also explains why she takes it so personally when Myrtle criticizes her for it. Lilo's main problem at this point is that she's suffering from loneliness. She is separated from her sister by a large age gap and the other girls her age all think she's weird, so she's reduced to latching onto Myrtle and her cronies regardless of their open contempt for her out of desperation. The writers do a great job at portraying her situation believably and it's hard wrenching to see her clinging to her homemade doll's grump or wishing for the nicest angel you have to be her friend in a matter of fact tone. This is a child, barely of school age, who has already dealt with so much pain in her short life that it has become commonplace to her. Lilo Cuddling's grandpa Lila wishes for a friend one subtle but key part of Lilo's characterization is her desire for some control over her life, undoubtedly born out of the trauma she's suffered. Judging from the photograph she keeps of her family and the gentle way the adults deal with her and Nani, the accident in which their parents died must not have been long ago. Lilo's response to this tragedy seems to be to try to impose some kind of order in her life with routines and hobbies, many of which, such as feeding Pudge, are designed to prevent such a horrible incident ever occurring again. Her passion for photography may also be related to this desire to keep things the same, capturing seemingly random moments for posterity in case the worst should happen again, perhaps she even feels like she's protecting the terrorist she snaps, in a way. Although there was also an abandoned racial angle, which framed her photography as a means of regaining control of her identity from the objectification of the tourists by turning the lens on them. Lilo photographing the fact tourist outside of trauma, you could also make a reasonable argument that Lilo's behavior is the result of her being autistic. She sticks to specific routines and gets upset if they're questioned or disrupted, she's very intelligent, tends to be obsessive about her interests, and has trouble writing people's emotions, as we see from our apparent obliviousness to Myrtle's hatred of her and our confusion over Nani's grief the night before their separation. It's never been confirmed by Disney, but it's still a possibility and makes for an interesting way to look at her character. Lilo in the hammock once Stitch arrives and meets her, Lilo is quick to take him in and becomes his staunchest defender, even after he repeatedly causes havoc with her life and family. She seems to relate to him as a fellow outsider and spends a montage trying to teach Stitch to fit in by basically turning him into a miniature Alice impersonator, but, this ultimately fails due to Stitch's destructive nature. Still, Lilo considers Stitch a part of her extended family and is fiercely loyal to him for much of the film, despite Ani's vehement objections to him. For understandable reasons, family, or a Hannah, is very important to Lilo and she does her best to help Stitch adjust, but while she is patient with him for a long time, she finally loses it when he destroys her home and nearly gets her taken away from her sister. This moment is made more painful because by this point, Stitch has finally learned to care for the girl and feels genuine remorse for the trouble he's caused her. Stitch rescues Lilo however, no sooner has all this happened than Captain Gadu appears out of nowhere to capture Stitch and ends up napping Lilo as well. Stitch promptly escapes and soon ropes the other aliens and Ani into a daring rescue, because thanks to Lilo, he has finally realized where he belongs and isn't about to let anyone break up his family. By the end of the film, he and Lilo have overcome their respective issues, or are, at least, well on their way to doing so, and settled down to a life of fun and shenanigans together, accepting each other just the way they are. Lilo is a strong, unconventional lead in her relationship with Stitch is both touching and complex. I can only hope we see another fascinating character like her at the forefront of a new Disney film down the line, because after decades of boring child characters with no personality, Lilo made a very welcome change. Stitch comes out of Crater Stitch Lost in the Forest Stitch, or Experiment 626, is the little alien fugitive who shares the spotlight with Lilo here.
he is just as much of a protagonist as she is, as his character lay at the foundation of the whole production. However, Stip starts out as more of a villain than a protagonist, rather like Cusco was in The Emperor's New Groove, he's cocky, wild and aggressive, remaining this way through the entire first act. We are introduced to him at Dr. Jumpa's trial, where his creator is under fire for illegal genetic experimentation after Stitch deliberately fails to prove to the council that he can be good. He is sentenced to life in exile on a desert asteroid, but stages a daring escape by hijacking one of the police cruisers and then uses his hyperdrive to reach Earth. Here, while attempting to hide from Jumba and Pleakley, who have been sent to recapture him, he comes across Lolo searching for a dog at the local animal shelter. He quickly conceives of a plan to protect himself by posing as her dog, knowing that alien law will prevent his pursuers from revealing themselves in front of his human family at first. He finds this forced domestication almost unenterable. One of the funniest scenes in the film is of him and Lila wandering around town, with Stitch seething with barely suppressed rage and going crazy at everyone who so much as looks at him. When she takes him home, he continues to struggle with his innate destructiveness, even building a toy replica of San Francisco just so he can destroy it. However, over time, he begins to warm up to Lilo as she teaches him about the world, or at least her idea of it, all building up to the beach scene. Stitch wants to go surfing by this point, Stitch's rambunctious ways have cost Donnie several potential jobs and things are looking bleak for her and Lilo. Their friend David then steps in to cheer them up, spending the afternoon surfing with them and having fun, it is this which finally shows Stitch what it means to belong and he tries to involve himself in their activities, first by imitation, then by shyly gesturing for Lilo to surf with him. His vulnerability in this scene is particularly poignant as we've seen him struggling with his identity in earlier scenes, unsure of what his purpose is or where his own family might be. Unfortunately, due to another botched attempt by Jumba and Pleakley to catch him, Lilo is nearly drowned and the social worker has seen enough, declaring that he must take Lilo away for her own safety. That night, knowing that the mess is his fault, Stitch guiltily leaves the Pilker home, taking with him Lilo's reassurance that she will remember him and a copy of The Ugly Duckling, a story which he has come to identify with. Out in the nearby forest, he turns to the page where the duckling's family finds it and begins waiting for his own family, tragically unaware of the circumstances of his birth when Jumba finds the little alien the next morning, Stitch is a changed creature, no longer wild and destructive, he has grown calm and learned to express himself in words, which clearly surprises Jumba. However, the tactless scientist insists that Stitch cannot ignore his programming and, rather stupidly, tugs him that he's going to take him apart, leading to the chase and fight which destroy Lilo's home. Councilwoman puts Stitch with family after Lilo is accidentally captured. But Gantu, Stitch bravely takes it upon himself to rescue his friend, having internalized her message that being part of a family means nobody gets left behind. Stitch is highly engaging because he goes through significant character development in tandem with Lilo. Both start out as misunderstood orphans with no place in the world, but they help each other to form individual identities and wind up as good friends. Everything from their sizes to their names binds them together, Lilo means lost in Hawaiian, the very word Stitch describes himself with late in the film, so together their names could be taken as lost and pulled together the friendship between these two is one of the best developed we've seen thus far in the canon, which I think is one of the key reasons why the film was so well received. People relate to realistically portrayed relationships and it's easy to root for these two adorable misfits, creating a solid core around which the rest of the film is based. Nani looking at superhero Stitch Nani holding the hammer Nani cuddles Lilo and bet another strong character is Lilo's older sister, Nani, who has become our guardian in the wake of their parents' deaths and is struggling to adapt to the role. It is thanks to Nani that Lilo and Stitch meet at all, because after sadly overhearing Lilo wishing for a friend she comes up with the idea of getting our dog. Of course, this doesn't quite go to plan and they end up with Stitch, who starts out as a little blue nightmare that causes mayhem wherever he goes. It's easy to sympathize with Nani, especially once you get older. She's doing the best she can, but she's too young herself to be handling so much responsibility by herself. Her official age is 19, apparently. At a point in time when she should be just starting to build a life for herself, she has had to put everything on hold to look after her sister. Judging from the trophies we see in her room and her skills in the waves later, she seems to have been a budding surfer at one point, but she's had to put the dream on hold to act as a parent to her sister. Nani's relationship with Lilo is nicely handled, they feel just like real sisters, having blazing rose one minute and then cuddling together the next, but their dynamic is complicated by Nani's new role as her sister's guardian, a position which neither is fully comfortable with yet. I like you better as a sister than a mom. Despite her frustrations, Nani tries hard to be patient with Lilo and is very protective of her. As she says to Cobra Bubbles, she's the only one who understands Lilo and the lower sister's quirks do still sometimes perplex her, she has learned to live with them.
She doesn't get angry with Lilo for getting into a fight, but she does have her limits. Like any real person, Nani has a breaking point, which she reaches after Lilo purposely messes up the visit with a social worker. Even then, however, she keeps herself under control, smacking the floor and screaming into a pillow once Lilo's gone to avoid taking out her frustrations on her sister. Nani holding Lilo's arm Nani's idea of getting Lilo a dog when she's lonely is a great one, even though it will put further strain on their presumably limited finances. Once Lich arrives and starts proving troublesome, Nani still makes a valiant effort to accept him after Lilo reminds her that Stitch is now a part of their Aunt Hannah, but it's no picnic dealing with him. It's implied that she and Lilo haven't been having much luck with social workers up to this point as it is, but Stitch makes everything ten times worse, costing Nani her job and preventing her from getting a new one. Despite all this, however, she never tries to insist that Lilo give up Stitch, after that one time, and even seems to warm up to the little alien after a while. Unfortunately, this budding acceptance is promptly ended during the beach scene, where Stitch nearly drowns Lilo accidentally. Nani sings to Lilo. In the wake of this accident and the resulting decision from Cobra to take Lilo away, Nani is faced with the horrible prospect of having to explain to her infant sister what's going to happen. Unable to find the words, she instead chooses to sing a beautifully tender rendition of the famous Hawaiian classic, Aloha, holding Lilo close to her as she sings her heartfelt farewell. After racing out, the next day for one last job opportunity, things get even worse as she sees a fire truck turning onto her street while she's gone, your heart just drops with hers as you imagine the possibilities that must be running through her head. We then get one of the most brutally real scenes in the film where Nani argues in vain with Cobra as he puts Lilo in the car, ready to take her away forever. Her pain over losing our sister is tangible and almost too real, only made worse when she sees Lilo being kidnapped by Captain Kanto and gets left behind, powerless to stop it. Nani sobbing crucially, it is Nani who instigates the rescue operation, with the help of Stitch. Jumbo and Pleakley are keen to stay out of it and try to feign ignorance of the whole thing, but Nani angrily insists that they help her get Lilo back. When they still refuse, she collapses, hopeless and crushed at the thought of losing her beloved sister, but then Slitch steps in and galvanizes the others into action. It is this act which solidifies the bond between them and Nani once and for all, as she sees how much he truly cares about Lilo. Once everybody is safely back on the beach, Nani thus embraces Slitch as a part of his and Lilo's and Hannah, her family is safe at last, and with that, her arc is complete. Jumbo says Unleash a Jumbo listening to Hound Dog among the other alien characters, our main one is Dr. Jumbo Jacoba. This is the guy responsible for creating Stitch, or, Experiment 626, a crime for which he is locked up in the film's prologue. However, the Grand Councilwoman ends up making a bargain with him after being convinced by Agent Pleakley that only Jumbo knows Stitch well enough to be able to catch him, offering him his freedom in exchange for Stitch's capture. To keep the self-proclaimed evil genius under control, the councilwoman assigns Pleakley to accompany him and so sets the stage for hijinks. Despite his unsavory reputation, Jumba is a likable chap in his own way, with a certain warmth and humanity to him that tells the audience he is not as evil as he says he is. He's a mischief maker more than anything, simply enjoying chaos in the way that a toddler might gleefully see how far he can push the ones in charge. His description of what Stitch would actually do if he could get to a large city is hysterically anticlimactic, although it doesn't quite mesh with what Stitch himself seems to be planning with his little San Francisco Dharma, makes you wonder what the little guy might have been capable of if he hadn't met Lilo. Jumbo and Pleakley discuss Stitch in disguise for their mission on Earth, Jumbo and Pleakley don rather unconvincing human disguises to avoid revealing their identities, as Pleakley warns that humans are extremely primitive creatures who would panic at the sight of such monsters, doesn't seem to be a problem when Stitch appears in the Merry Monarch Festival at the end, but I digress. Jumbo is the impatient and impulsive one of the two, constantly itching to just nab Stitch and get it over with, but he is kept in check for most of the time by Pleakley. At times, he shows a certain curiosity in his little experiment, perhaps seeing the mission as an opportunity to study Stitch from a distance and learn more about him, but for the rest of the time he seems to view Stitch as more of a nuisance and is clearly only interested in capturing him to regain his freedom at first. After an attempt to snap Stitch from the waves during a surfing session with the girls fails, Jumbo and Pleakley end up being fired by the councilwoman for their incompetence. After this, Jumbo is finally free to do things his way and barges into Lilo's house chasing Stitch, completely destroying it in the process. This thoughtlessness is arguably Jumbo's biggest flaw. He's not really evil, he just gets carried away with his schemes and tends to disregard other people's well-being. Even so, he handles the answer in confrontation with Nani with the tact more tact than a pedantic Cleakley, explaining that their hands are tied while acknowledging her distress, showing us that he does have a sensitive side when it counts. 
And of course, how bad can someone be when they go out of their way to rescue someone they barely know for the sake of what's right? By the end of the film, Jumba seems to have become attached to his little experiment, perhaps the result of having watched him grow and change into the more grounded alien switch becomes. Jumba ends the film firmly on the side of the good guys, which is a pretty rare turnaround for a villainous character in the Disney canon. Agent Pleakley calls Councilwoman Crazy Head Pleakley tries on the wig Agent Pleakley, Jumpa's colleague, is the Galactic Council's resident expert on the planet Earth and the film's fun and beleaguered sidekick character. In his first scene, he single-handedly saves the world by preventing the Councilwoman from guessing the entire planet to kill Stitch, after explaining to him that Earth is a protected wildlife preserve. Unfortunately, he paints himself into a corner with his strict adherence to the rules and winds up assigned to escort Jumpa on Earth while the evil scientist recaptures his rogue experiment. Pleakley is similar to Zazu, Sebastian and most particularly Coxworth, whose voice actor, David Ogden Stiers, Rip, plays Jumba here, he's a rather stuffy nice guy who wants nothing more than a quiet life and believes following the rules will get him that, but for most of this film, he has been thrust entirely out of his element and must learn to cope with his colleague's eccentricities. Pleakley's function is basically to add a little like comic relief with his shrill indignation at Jumba's harebrained schemes, holding back his craziness until the two of them are fired. He is portrayed as somewhat effeminate, donning a female disguise on Earth which he seems to enjoy wearing, and bickers with Jumbo like they're an old married couple, but thankfully such jokes have aged fairly well for the most part and don't come across as mean-spirited. Pleakley is definitely a character we're supposed to like and it's easy to do so. Pleakley explains misuse of galactic resources The only time where Pleakley's attitude becomes problematic is after Lilo's kidnap. Despite Ani's obvious distress, Pleakley rather tactlessly continues to brush off her pleading for them to bring her sister back, too fixated on following protocol to think of comforting her. Still, once Stitch has initiated the rescue, Pleakley does, reluctantly, go along with the others and afterwards, on the beach, it is he who suggests to the councilwoman that Stitch be allowed to stay with his new family. He may be a bureaucrat, but he's got a heart, possibly several, being an alien. Cobra Bubbles at the door for the role of Cobra Bubbles, Keith David was initially considered, will be coming back to him down the line, but the character ultimately went to Vin Rames and bears a resemblance to the gangster Marcellus Wallace from Pulp Fiction, 1994, who Rames also played. Cobra is a social worker, special classification, who has been tasked with making sure Lilo is being properly provided for after her parents' deaths in his presence lends the film a degree of seriousness which might come as a surprise in this otherwise light-hearted film. Although he is a rather imposing figure in his dark suit and glasses, Cobra is not a villain and is never really positioned as one, which I appreciated. He is simply doing his job and it is made clear that he genuinely cares about Lilo's well-being, as he keeps a close eye on proceedings during his time in Hawaii. It's easy to see how bad things look from his perspective. The very day he meets Lilo and Nani, he finds the six-year-old home by herself, with the still bun and the door locked and nailed shut, while Nani is calling threats through the dog door and holding a hammer. Things don't improve inside, with Lilo displaying clear signs of lingering trauma, my friends need to be punished, and reciting what she thinks he wants to hear as if by rote. Cobra on the beach with Nani the next day, he returns to the house after hearing that Nani has lost her job and is introduced, quite violently, to Stitch, a monstrous looking creature which Lilo cheerfully announces is her puppy. The fact that they are buying new pets at a time like this can look good to Cobra. After tasking Ani with finding a new job, he then watches as she tries and fails time and time again to secure one, apparently unaware of Stitch's involvement in the chaos, before finally witnessing Lilo's near drowning while surfing. This is the last straw in Cobra, although clearly disappointed and upset with how things have turned out, is forced to tell Nani that he must take Lilo away. His conviction is only reinforced the next morning when he gets a strange call from Lilo about aliens and chainsaws and then arrives to find her all by herself again, standing outside the flaming wreckage of her house. Really, after what he's seen, do you blame him for thinking Lilo might be in danger living with Nani? Nonetheless, it's still a real punch to the gut when he puts Lilo into his car, it feels so final, and his angry argument with Nani about the appalling state things have gotten into only makes it worse. Cobra talks to Nani at the end when Lilo promptly escapes, Cobra is just as worried as everyone else, but we don't see him again until the final rendezvous on the beach. Here, he has apparently grasped enough of the situation to understand what's going on, it's revealed that he's a former CIA agent with previous experience of alien contact, so he likely suspected Stitch's true identity all along, and has the brain of it reminding Lilo about her purchase of Stitch at the animal shelter, knowing that the alien's devotion to following rules will create a loophole allowing Stitch to stay.
Essentially, this means that Cobra is responsible for keeping Lilo's family together, making him a very effective social worker and a great friend, to boot. I must admit he's my favorite character. Grant counts the woman, which charges the Grant. Counts the woman, head of the United Galactic Federation, as a small but pivotal role as she holds power over Stitch's fate. She first appears at Jumba's trial, where she sentences the scientist to prison and Stitch to exile, but after the ingenious aliens escape she is then faced with a more complicated matter of catching him, once her initial proposal to destroy Kawa is shot down, of course. She cleverly traps Pleakley into joining Jumba on a mission and proceeds to keep tabs on them both throughout, until she finally loses patience with him and replaces them with Captain Gadu, offering him a chance to redeem himself after letting Stitch escape in the first place. After Gadu, too, fails in his mission, she finally comes to Earth herself, only to find that the once uncontrollable, Stitch has now mellowed into a more reasonable alien. This puts her in a bit of a bind, because she cannot change what the Council has decided and yet sees for herself that exile is no longer a fitting fate for the little guy. Her happy reaction when Lilo presents her with an excuse to let him stay on Earth shows us that, for all her sternness, she is a firm good-hearted leader who's willing to do the right thing, even if it is mean bending the rules slightly. Incidentally, she also offers her fair share of comedy with her dry sarcasm and obvious contempt for Jumba and Pleakley. Captain Gadu catches Stitch. Captain Gadu is the closest thing to a full villain in this film, due largely to his obvious hatred of Stitch, which seems to be founded in some sort of alien racism. He is a towering behemoth of an alien who was initially put in charge of transporting Stitch to the asteroid that he is to be exiled on, a task which he takes avid and delight in, at least until the little darling bites him on the finger. However, Stitch proves too resourceful for Gantu and quickly escapes the ship on a hijacked police cruiser, humiliating Gantu and motivating a strong desire for revenge. He gets his chance later in the film after Jumba and Pleakley have failed to bring Stitch back by the appointed time. The councilwoman hands the mission over to him and he departs immediately, capturing the little alien almost as soon as he arrives, with a surprising amount of stealth for such an massive creature. He shows no feeling or understanding towards Lilo, simply regarding her as a little snap for Stitch during the right back, which makes you wonder what he would have done with her had he gotten her back into space and found her without Stitch. Gantu and Stitch have the final showdown in the skies in which he describes Stitch as vile, foul, flawed and an abomination, suggesting some sort of blood supremacy hang-up regarding Stitch's unusual origins, but the little alien finally triumphs and destroys Gantu's ship, leaving him clinging for dear life onto Stitch's. The last we see of him is on the beach, where he is retired in disgrace by the council woman, presumably for his blatant disregard for safety and secrecy while on Earth. Good riddance. David performing with fire David holding Lil David Kona is a minor character but a welcome part of the cast. He is a local fire performer at the Lunanami he works at, at least until she is fired, and is a supportive and caring friend to both girls, doing what he can to keep their spirits up during this difficult time and even helping Ani to find a job when he knows she's at risk of losing our sister. His role may be small, but he and Nani share one of the most believable relationships we've seen so far in the canon. They feel just like two real people looking out for one another and share strong chemistry. It's not overstated and makes up only a small subplot in the film, but for once, the romance doesn't feel gemmed in and ties in neatly with the main plot, as David does his part to help the girls in their endeavor to stay together and thus earns Nani's affections. He's a likable lad and it's extremely satisfying to see holiday snaps of him and the girls at the end, we know they'll be happy with someone like David watching their backs. Moses Poole I could believe great rescue Lady Myrtle, Yuki, Elena and Teresa L.R. Teresa, Elena, Myrtle and Yuki the only other named characters of note are the various locals of Lilo's village, including our Hula teacher, whose name is Moses Poole Loki, and the unnamed rescue lady from whom she buys Stitch. Both characters treat her with a kind of gentle respect, which was nice to see, a subtle clue to the recentness of the tragedy. Moses is rather beleaguered by Lilo's antics in class, but he is patient and understanding with her as much as possible. The rescue lady is also friendly enough, although she demonstrates a certain intolerance for weirdness, which Ani hurriedly waves aside, could she be related to Myrtle? They do look very similar. Myrtle is the leader of the other little girls from Lilo's Hula class, her red hair tested fine to her status as a howl, or a non-native islander. She is obnoxious and rude towards Lilo, excluding her from the girls' activities simply for being a little quirky, and it's implied that the others might not be so rotten to Lilo if they were freed from Myrtle's control. Her three friends are named Yuki, played by Lady Shida, Elena, Jillian Henry, and Teresa, Kelly Whitehurst, but there's little to distinguish them and they function as a group, rejecting Lilo and Las Mrs.
Hazel and Stitch Kiki and Stitch Hotel Clerk and Stitch Lifeguard. In addition to these, there are an assortment of unnamed employees that Ani speaks with about job opportunities, starting with Mrs. Hazagawa. She is a small, short-sighted and profoundly deaf old woman who runs a fruit stall in the market and has great difficulty in understanding people when they're speaking at anything less than 60 decibels. Next, Nani speaks with a kindly middle-aged woman working at Kiki's Coffee Hut, presumably Kiki herself since she seems to be the owner, who expresses reluctance at being unable to hire Nani at that point. Nani also speaks with a rather snobbish blonde-haired hotel clerk, before finally trying her luck with a similarly blunt Baywatch-style lifeguard on the beach. Both of these characters imply that they may have been opening for Nani, until Stitch wrecks things as usual. One subtle thing you notice during the montage in which all these characters appear is that Nani seems to be on first name terms with most of the native Hawaiians, but is less familiar with the Hulls. I hope I'm not using that word inappropriately, I can't tell for sure whether it's supposed to be insulting. It's another of those small touches which adds authenticity to the depiction of the setting. Animation The animation supervisors of Lilo and Stitch included Andreas Dijit for Lilo, Alex Kuperschmid for Stitch, Stefan Santa Ferry for Nani, Byron Howard for Kotbura, Bo Humbachi before Jumba, Ruben Aquino for David and Pleakley, James Jackson Young for the Grand Council Women, Theodore Anthony Litai for Captain Gadu, Markin for the Holo Dancers and Dominic M. Carolla for the teacher. Andreas, Dijit took on the assignment of supervising Lilo's animation after departing from Kingdom of the Sun, but you'll remember was having tremendous difficulties as it morphed into the Emperor's new groove. With the advice of such luminaries as Brad Bird and Ollie Johnston echoing in his ears, he focused on keeping his acting subtle with her, getting across a lot of emotion with minimal expressions and movements. One of the greatest challenges for Alex Kuperschmidt in animating Stitch was that it was very difficult to convey to the audience how he was feeling, mainly because his eyes lap pupils. They got around this by making him much more physically expressive, subtlety certainly wasn't the aim with this character. You can see the problems they had towards the end of the film, once Stitch has calmed down a little. With his black eyes, his face becomes rather expressionless, but luckily for the animators, he has started to speak more by this point and so his voice carries the weight of the emotion which his actions formerly had. Lilo and Stitch Hollow Dancers as always, the Disney animators went above and beyond to ensure accuracy in their work. To prepare for animating the traditional hula dancing of Hawaii, so often caricatured elsewhere, the crew attended renowned halau, or hula school, and modeled their poses on those of the dancers, though without rotoscoping. The character animation here is as exquisite as ever, with lots of short scenes carried purely by the comic understatement of the character's acting. Most of Cobra Bubble's scenes are a riot, for instance, simply because of his deadpan reaction to all the craziness he's faced with. Stitch also has his moments, particularly when he's not the focus of the scene. Pay attention to him whenever he's in a scene with other characters and you'll notice a lot of funny little expressions and gestures from him that are easily missed the first time around. Like many other Disney films before that, Lilo and Stitch also includes cameo appearances by the directors. They're in the beach scene just after Stitch has broken the water gown apart and terrified the sunbathers. As they scatter past Cobra Bubbles, the last two guys to run by him, one small and blonde, the other large and bearded, are caricatures of directors Chris Sanders and Dean DeBlu, respectively. Lilo hides and Dryer Interestingly, some aspects of the animation were subject to revision to avoid causing offense, both before and after the film's release. There's a moment just after Cobra's first visit has ended in disaster where Lilo runs to hide from an irate nanny. Clearly used to this, Nani waits a moment and then heads out back to Lilo's usual hiding place, which turns out to be in a little cover covered up with a pizza box. In the original cut of the film, this was a dryer, but complaints were raised by Britain's BBFC that this could endanger real children who might try to imitate Lilo and get trapped, so the dryer was edited into the coverage for the UK release of the film. If you listen closely, you'll notice the sound of the dryer door opening is still in place. Spaceships fly through mountains. There was also a major set piece in the climax which had to be altered before release due to unfortunate real world events. In the final chase between Gantu and the others, the spaceship used by Stitch and Company was originally going to be a hijacked Boeing 747 from Lihu Airport, which they would use to chase Gantu amongst the skyscrapers of Honolulu while crashing into them, but obviously, in the wake of the 9 11 attacks of 2001, this became inappropriate. Therefore, the scene was tweaked to have the spaceships flying through canyons and mountains instead, while keeping the basic action the same. The CGI model of the plane was turned into Jumba's spaceship and luckily only a few shots had to be fully reanimated. Plot in an unusual move, directors Sanders and Deplu led the story team themselves, a decision which paid off as it lent the film a degree of intimacy which some earlier features lacked.
Right from the start, Lilo and Stitch was a very personal vision. The subplot about Lilo's family problems marked a new, more realistic direction for a Disney film and is masterfully done, making the scenes between her and Nani arguably more engaging than the alien parts. The film story makes good use of the Hawaiian concept of a hana to explore what a family actually is and what its members' responsibilities are to one another. All of the plot elements are tied neatly together. I especially like the ways in which Lilo and Stitch are connected through their shared loneliness and status as outcasts, with both relating to the story of the ugly duckling. This theme is one of several aspects which connect the film to Dumbo. Things even take an existential turn at times, such as once which is standing alone in Lilo's room in the middle of the night, wondering what to do with himself because he has no greater purpose stitch with the ugly duckling along the way, several story elements were changed or dropped as the production progressed. In early draft Stitch was planned to be the leader of an intergalactic gang, with Jumbo set up as one of his former cronies who was then summoned by the council to capture the little rogue. This ended up being changed due to reactions from test audiences, with Stitch and Jumbo's relationship becoming one of creator and creation instead. The trial scene in the prologue also began with Stitch as the defendant and Jumbo not present at all, but this ended up being changed because the writers decided the council needed to blame him for creating Stitch in the first place. One scene that was drastically reworked was the beach scene, in which Lilo was originally going to attempt to make Stitch into a model citizen by having him notify the tourists about an upcoming tsunami warning sign test. This can be seen here and honestly, I have to wonder why it was changed. Perhaps it was a little too on the nose for Disney, but it gives us an interesting glimpse into Lilo's complicated personality. She is frustrated with being objectified by the tourists and decides to mess with them by scaring the heck out of them just as she knows a sign test is coming. Some of the animation of the panicked sunbather scattering remained in the final scene, but in this version, it ends with Cobra alone on the beach with Lilo and Stitch. He raises an eyebrow at her, and she simply tells him, if you live here, you'd understand this would have been a pretty daring move for Disney to make, critiquing casual racism in the islands, so it's a shame they didn't go through with it. Panicking tourists Lilo and Stitch the changes continued, mostly in an effort to prevent the film becoming too serious or frightening for younger children. Jumbo's attack on Stitch at Lilo's house in the climax was going to be much more violent at first with knives and guns, but it was revised into the comic battle we'd get in the finished film after test audiences found the original a bit excessive. Then, there was a planned scene in which Lilo would introduce Stitch to Pubs the fish, who was only briefly seen in the finished film, only for Stitch to end up killing the fish, yikes, I see why that was dropped, and Lilo having to bury him in the same graveyard as her parents. You can see it here and it's easy to see why this had to go. It makes Switch look like a sadist. The scene with Nani bringing Lilo pizza to make up with her was also tweaked. Originally, Lilo would tell herself a bedtime story about a friendly but smelly bear named Toaster who longs for a friend, but this was changed to have her wishing on the falling star instead. Apparently, test audiences confused Nani for Lilo's mother at first. Life with Switch number 1 Life with Switch number 2 Life with Switch number 3 Life with Switch number 4 Life with Stitch number 5 Life with Switch number 6 The Vignettes of Life with Switch at the end of the film were a last minute addition. The directors worried that the animators would be annoyed with the extra work so late in production, but their decision was instead met with applause, which just goes to show how fully committed and devoted everybody was to the project. I'm glad these were included. After everything the pair have gone through, they really deserve to revel in their happy ending. Cinematography The style of the film drew inspiration from Disney's classic roots, taking elements from the illustrations of Tengman and Alak. Our director Rick Sluder even spent time talking to a living Disney legend, Maurice Noble, who was then in his early 90s and gave the film his blessing. He passed away shortly before its completion, in 2001. However, the key artistic influence was Chris Sanders himself, whose drawing style permeated the entire production. The characters and objects in their world were given smooth, rounded edges, the animators referred to them as chopped up, to create a soft, cradling environment for Lilo. For much of the time, the camera's perspective is also kept low to reflect Lilo's perception of the world. When designing the film's extraterrestrial elements, particularly the spaceships, the artists looked to the marine life of Hawaii for inspiration, drawing from creatures as diverse as crabs and whales. Lilo and Stitch Scenery Number One Lilo and Stitch Scenery Number Two Lilo and Stitch Scenery Number Three Lilo and Stitch Scenery Number Four Lilo and Stitch Scenery Number Five Lilo and Stitch 
Scenery number six, little and stitch scenery number seven, little and stitch scenery number eight, little and stitch scenery number nine, little and stitch scenery number ten, little and stitch scenery number eleven, little and stitch scenery number twelve, little and stitch scenery number thirteen, little and stitch scenery number fourteen, little and stitch scenery number fifteen. The whole film is simple, but very beautiful. It marked Disney's first return to watercolor backgrounds in almost sixty years. But one thing Dumbo lacked was the lush visuals on display here. The artists avoided using harsh white paint in their palette, instead relying on the whiteness of their paper to illuminate the pigments from behind, giving the backgrounds a gentle glow. The use of tone mats, foreshading and shadows on the characters, was also kept to a minimum to distinguish the film's look from that of the stylized renaissance features before it. In the early stages of production, the film was going to be set in Kansas. However, Sanders later made the decision to switch the setting of the Hawaiian island of Kauai, which proved a pivotal moment for defining the plot more clearly. The island of Kauai had previously been featured in several Spielberg productions like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Jurassic Park, but this marked the first time that Hawaii had been used as the setting for an animated film and the state looks truly glorious, especially when Switch is riding the stolen bike around it at one point. Small touches add a great deal of authenticity, such as the fact that Yellow typically wears a woman the appearance she and her holo group make at the real Mary Mark festival of the end of the film. The surfer statue featured in one of the photos during the end credits is a real Hawaiian landmark on Waikiki Beach, depicting Duke Kahanamoku, a surfing legend and Olympic gold medal winner who was considered the father of the sport in its modern form. Nani also has a poster of him in a room, which you can see during Stitch and Jumba's fight, as Stitch delivers a second blow to Jumba with a Volkswagen Beetle, the expression on Dude's face changes to one of surprise. Stitch at the Merry Monarch Festival Jumba by the Dude poster A few live action touches are worked in here and there, with a real clip from the 1958 creature feature the spider playing in a shop windows to the delight of Stitch. Nani also has a real poster of the film Mule and on her wall, a nod to the team's previous work on the production as well as to Tia Carreri being considered at one point for that character's voice. Stitch watches the spider, there are some great visual gaps worked in, too, with my favorite being the one with Plikla's Viewmaster. He whips this out any time he wants to educate someone about Earth, but the joke is that Viewmasters only work because of an optical illusion created by the viewer's own eyes, of which it is assumed they have two. A three-dimensional effect is produced because each of the viewer's eyes is focusing on a slightly different image, but Pleakley is a one-eyed alien and so would not be able to use the device himself. Nor would Jumba, for that matter, who has four eyes, although he could be just using his closest to the eye, suppose. Indeed, only the Grand Council Woman has the correct number of eyes to use a viewmaster. Soundtrack Alan Silvestri was the director's first choice for composer and a scholar is charmingly childlike, with lots of gentle percussion punctuated with triumphant brass in the happier moments. The main theme, her clearly once the rescues Lilo from Gantt's ship, is an uplifting tearjerker. The film features two original songs written and performed by Oatu native Marquis de Hummel, backed by the Kamehameha School's Children's Chorus. The first is Emil no Lilo, which begins over the very late opening credits as the film shifts from the alien prologue to Hawaii. This is a truly beautiful song, my favorite from this film, which is saying something from a soundtrack packed with Elvis classics, which showcases Hawaiian culture with its untranslated lyrics and the use of Hawaiian percussion instruments like the ep. In English, the song is all about the beauty of Hawaii and pays homage to its last monarch, Queen Lilokalani, whose composition Aloha there was also featured. Emil Nolilo imagery number one in case you missed him, this is Pudge. Emil Nolilo imagery number two Emil No Lilo imagery number three Emil Nolilo imagery number four however, the song is not without some controversy. Some critics have noted that the melody and lyrics have been taken from other historically significant Hawaiian songs, including Kokao Noa and Kawai Kai Kamoku, which has caused some friction now that Disney owns the copyright to these snippets in Emil Nolilo. Lilo and Stitch may well be one of Disney's more culturally sensitive offerings, but this note makes it clear that cultural appropriation is a difficult thing to pull off without causing offense. Hawaiian roller coaster right imagery number one, Hawaiian roller coaster right imagery number two, Hawaiian roller coaster right imagery number three, Hawaiian roller coaster right imagery number four, Hawaiian roller coaster ride is the second original song of the film and it's a lot of fun, very catchy with a cool tropical beat to it. It plays during the pivotal beach scene just after Stitch has wrecked Ani's last attempt at getting a job, when David suggests that they enjoy a spot of surfing to lighten their moods. Stitch goes through some character development over the course of the song, slowly realizing what being part of a family is like and shyly attempting to make his way into Lilo's. 
Naturally, given Lilo's enthusiasm for the king, the soundtrack is also packed with plenty of great Ellis numbers, most of which are used cleverly to fit the theme of the scenes they're featured in. I particularly enjoyed the use of Suspicious Minds and Devil in Disguise, but the film also includes Stuck on You, Heartbreak Hotel and Hound Dog. Ellis's versions of these five were released in 1969, 1963, 1960 and 1956 both respectively. Ellis Presley did several films, concerts and personal appearances in Hawaii, which could explain Lilo's fascination with him. It's so funny when even Jumbo recognizes his songs, he's universal, baby. Aloha a long shot look at the differences in their expressions here. Poor Lilo doesn't know what's about to happen there's also a very, touching use of the Hawaiian classic Aloha, Farewell to Thee, in one of the film's most poignant scenes. The piece was written around 1878 by Queen Liliokalani, the last monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii, as if farewell to her country before its forced annexation into the United States. The song has become a cultural symbol of the islands, but it also goes well with this moment and is something of a surprising choice for an American-made film, given the context. Since Lilo and Nani are also about to be torn apart by an agent of the U.S. government, however reluctant he is about it, it ties everything together thematically and feels like the perfect choice for the scene. It even complements Lilo's passion for Elvis, because he covered it himself in the film Blue Hawaii, 1961. Over the end credits, we get no less than three covers, at least in the British release. The first is a rocking cover of Burning Love, sung by Elvis in 1972 as one of the last big rock hits of his career and performed with fantastic energy here by Winona Judd. It's a great way to wrap up the film as we watch short scenes of Stitch enjoying life with his new family, and I chose it as my 24th favorite credit song in an earlier post. This is followed by a cover of Suspicious Minds by Gareth Gates, which is only included in the British version as far as I know. It's a smashing song and Gates is a good job with it, although I have to confess that until preparing this review, I'd always assumed it was a woman singing it. Bless him, he was only about 18 at the time. Finally, we get Swedish group The Eighteen singing Elvis's 1961 hit Can't Have Falling in Love. Frankly, I don't like this one at all. The cover feels very generic and out of place, a tacky pop ballad which has little thematic relevance to the film. It's not even about falling in love, seriously, but I suppose it's peppy enough and at least it's saved until the end of the credits. D. Writing for Lilo and Stitch is strong and simple, with little time wasted on filler. Some of the dialogue is a scream. My single favorite scene for the writing has to be the one where Lilo is at the animal shelter trying to convince Nani and the rescue lady to let her take Stitch home. It's comic perfection. Nani and the rescue lady chat while waiting for Lilo to pick a dog and the rescue lady says, all of our dogs are adoptable Q Stitch's entry, at which point both women leap onto their chairs and the rescue lady screams except that one. Nani cries, what is that thing? And is told, a dog, I think, but it was dead this morning. It was dead this morning. Well, we thought it was dead. It was hit by a truck. That's enough for Lilo. Running from ear to ear, she proclaims, I like him. That part always is me in Stitches, no pun intended. Stitch insults the council. There's also some creative use of language, with an alien language called Tagalog used at times for Stitch and the others. Me Ganela Kawista. Roughly translates to I want to destroy. And Hawaiian peppering the dialogue of the human characters. Lela, Awa, Ailwala. That latter aspect was the idea of the actors voicing Ani and David, Tia Karere, a native of Honolulu, and Jason Scott Lee, who was raised in the islands. They assisted the writers with their characters' dialogue to get the proper colloquial dialect and correct use of Hawaiian slang. All of the voice actors do a great job here, from Bing Rames's understated portrayal of Cobra to Tia Carreri's flexible range of the perpetually harassed Nani. My favorite moment for the voice acting is when Ani opens the door to Cobra and gives that hilarious off-screen gasp of horror, but special credit is due to young Deva Chase, who was only about nine when she voiced Lilo. She does a fantastic job of bringing the titular hero into life and her voice work is one of the main reasons Lilo is so memorable. Breva, Deva, Breva. David Ogden Stiers also deserves credit for his performance as Jumba, one of the finest of his career at Disney. Sadly, he passed away just last week aged 75. He will be sorely missed and fondly remembered by animation fans for his terrific contributions to the Disney canon. Final verdict, Lilo and Stitch had a very memorable marketing campaign. The teaser trailers for the film, known as Interstitials, involved recreations of scenes from several Renaissance classics such as Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid and The Lion King, which Stitch would then interrupt with disastrous consequences. 
The original actors involved in the scenes were brought back to reprise their roles and were apparently shocked at being asked to react negatively towards Stitch. The trailers also included the AC slash DC song Back in Black, while the UK once featured Gareth Gates' cover of Suspicious Minds. Upon release, Lilo and Stitch did well with critics and audiences alike, becoming one of the few real successes for Disney the decade. Christopher Finch complimented the character animation and Stephen Cavalier called it fresh and original it was nominated for the 2002 Academy Award for Best Animated Feature alongside Disney's other release from that year, Treasure Planet, but both lost to the studio Ghibli classic Spirited Away, which I'm sure you agree is fair enough. If they had to lose, they could hardly have done so to a more worthy opponent. Funnily enough, Spirited Away was distributed by Disney and also starred Deva Chase and David Ogden, stars in the English dub. The film was released to VHS and DVD in late 2002, with a second special edition DVD following in 2009 that featured a making of documentary, deleted scenes and games. In 2011, the film then got a Blu-ray release as part of a two-movie collection with its direct-to-video sequel from 2005, Lilo and Stitch 2. Stitch has a glitch. That was just one of the spin-offs generated by the film's popularity. There was also Stitch. The movie in 2003 into TV series which ran from 2003 to 2006. A third sequel was released to television in 2006, Leroy and Stitch, which served as the conclusion to the TV series. There was even an anime version titled Simply Stitch, which ran in Japan from 2008 to 2011, with further TV specials in 2012 and 2015. Most recently, a Chinese miniseries, called Stitch and I, debuted in 2017, with the English language version playing across Southeast Asia just last month. Looking back on Lilo and Stitch now, nearly 16 years on, good grief, that long. It still stands strong as one of Disney's most unexpected classics, with a reputation that only continues to grow as time goes by. Everything about it just works so well, the plot, the characters, the style, it all meshes beautifully into a warm and funny world which you never get tired of revisiting. Although most of Disney's film from the early 2000s have gone on to grow their own devoted fan bases, Lilo and Stitch never needed to worry because it had one from the beginning. If you've not seen this one, I definitely recommend it. It's a welcome change from the computer-dominated world of modern animation with its organic tone, but more than that, it's a good story well.